Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is producer-engineer Bill Reynolds. First of all, I don't know if you've heard, but Spotify has been hacked. And the way people found out about this is they were looking on their playlists, and these are just average users, and finding artists that no one knew who they were. And there is a number of distinctive properties about these artists. First of all, all the songs were very, very short, and they really had no sections. There were no verses and no choruses. There were few, if any, lyrics. In many cases, no lyrics at all. They all had generic cover art. They all had very short, nondescriptive, one-word song titles. And all of these artists that showed up have no presence on the internet other than Spotify. There's no social media. They don't have fan pages. There's no websites or concert listings or photos. Now, this in itself was enough to really upset many Spotify users. But then when they went and looked in their listening history, they found out that these mystery acts were logged as listens as well. So there's a couple of things that are happening. The first thing is they're getting a lot of streams that are coming from nowhere. And the second thing is suddenly they're appearing on all sorts of of playlists and no one knows who these acts are or where they came from. So this is something <laughs> that they're calling mystery core. It now has its own subgenre, mystery core. But anyway, if you have a Spotify account, just make sure you check it just to see if this is happening to you. Not that it's going to cost you any money, not that it's going to do anything, but the fact of the matter is there's someone getting paid for listens that aren't happening. There's someone that's appearing on your playlist that you don't know, and there's something wrong with that. Now, the bad part here is Spotify is not acknowledging that there's anything wrong, but it's a growing controversy, and I think you'll see more and more about this in the coming days. <laughs> If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. Don't forget about my online courses on mixing, production, branding, and music business success at bobbyosinskicourses.com. Also, get an independent analysis and objective opinion of your songs and mixes as a member of my Hitmakers Club. Go to hitmakersclub.com to learn more. <laughs> Now, there's been a lot of reports lately that Apple is going to switch processors pretty soon. Right now, Apple uses Intel processors in all of their computers, but the word is they're going to switch to a custom Apple-made ARM processor, ARM, and that stands for Advanced RISC Machines. RISC is Reduced Instruction Set Computing. So it's Advanced Reduced Instruction Set Computing Machine. <laughs> it's a long fancy word for a custom processor that doesn't use a lot of instructions. As a result, it's very, very efficient. And it's one of those things that would be really good for laptops. But since there's fewer instructions, unlike the generic Intel processors that they've been using, what that means is less heat, usually means less need for heat dissipation, which means a smaller case. So the new Apple Pro was reportedly due out in 20. 19. It looks like they're going to miss that. It looks more like 2020 now. That being said, it also looks like there's a good reason for it, and that's a switch to the new processors. Now, this has happened before, actually, so there's a precedent for it. Back in 2005, Apple switched their Macs from a PowerPC processor to Intel. And the PowerPC, of course, was a consortium between Apple and Intel and Motorola. When that happened, it caused everyone to actually upgrade the operating system, and that happened, all the software broke, so you basically had to update all of your software. In many cases, it meant upgrades, and there was a lot of people upset about that. In this case, the experts are saying it's not going to be a big disruption, or at least not as big as it was before. So look for that to happen. Be aware that it could mean that you might have to update all of your software. But again, some very smart people are predicting that's not going to happen. But keep an eye out anyway, because this is something that's in your future if you're a Mac user. 
My guest today is Bill Reynolds, who's a Grammy-nominated producer, engineer, mixer, songwriter, and former bass player of Band of Horses. Bill's credits include The Avett Brothers, Band of Horses, Truth and Salvage Company, Tim Chason, and Lissy, among others. And his songs have appeared on TV shows like House, Justified, and Army Wives. He currently works out of his personal Fleetwood Shack studio in Nashville. In the interview, we talked about vocal mix levels, being in a band, as well as being their producer, the amazing Nashville session players, using a tape machine again, and much more. Bill and I spoke via Skype from a studio in Nashville. I want to go back to the beginning. I know you're a bass player, first and foremost, as most of us are players that get into this. Give me some of your background. I understand that you turned down a full boat scholarship. Yeah. I started playing rock and roll, as we all do. And um, and then when I moved to North Carolina, uh, I didn't want to get into this certain high school. I, I didn't want to go to the high school that I was supposed to go to, so I, I started learning how to play the 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 um, classical bass and I studied it for quite a while I ended up at the North Carolina School of the Arts and I just kept going with it and then I ended up at getting a scholarship to Appalachian State University where I studied bass there well at the time I played bass with everybody in Boone um, it was just kind of like I would play a gig every single night and one of the bands I was playing with we ended up getting a record deal on sub pop records and so i left i left uh college at like i think 19 and we went on the road and we toured for six years with with that group and and then after that's when everything started for me was when i went on the road with that band and the band was called the blue rags Mm. yeah as a bass player as the bass player. Yeah. Um, at the time, we did a record with, um, our first record was done at CRC, Chicago Recording Company. Um, and our second record was done by this guy named Joe Blaney. Um, Joe Blaney is this New York engineer who did, um, he recorded um, combat, he, he recorded Clash, Combat Rock, and he recorded, he just recorded a bunch of big records that I really got into. Uh, and he ended up recording my band and taught me a ton about recording. So uh, when I got home, I bought a um, one inch 16 track recorder and uh, like a Mackie, like a little Mackie mixer. My buddy Aaron Price actually found it at a pawn shop and we just started making records like that. Um, And that's what I did for years is just work off that tape machine. Very cool. So it, it went from, it, it definitely, I took those skills from, from the school um, and it helped out a lot with playing with different groups. Um, even when I played with Band of Horses, we would do an acoustic tour. We did a acoustic tour for a long time and I played the upright bass and a lot of bow and a lot of, just a lot of the, a lot of using the bass on the road. You know, what I've always found is bass players make really good producers. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because of the focus on the rhythm section. Yeah. Well, I always tell people like that my job is literally just to, I listen to the singer and make the singer sound good and do the best I can. Right. Yeah. To, su- to support the band. Um, drummers and bass players make great, good, make great producers. I think uh, not to say anything bad about guitar players, but a lot of times when you're a guitar player and you produce, uh, you end up just building like little orchestras with your guitar. If you get too if you get too into it, because it's like you're so excited about all the stuff you can do on the guitar, it's hard to step away. Yeah, I know. And for some reason, I think what you just said is really true. The emphasis is more on the guitar rather than on the vocal a yeah. lot of times. You know, I found that myself. And sometimes you don't think about the vocal as much and you don't think about the lyrics as much and, and all the things that really do matter to the, the final listener. Exactly. That's 100% it. I mean... It, Every record that I've had that's done well is, I to me, is solely because there's a great vocal. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. like when it all boils down, when my girlfriend walks in and says like if something's good or bad, she doesn't care about the bass part or the kick drum sound or any of that. If the vocal hits in the right place, she's gonna say this is good, you know. Yeah. And that's really what matters. Okay. That being said, where do you come down on where the vocal should fit in the mix? 
And I know that this is a genre thing to some degree, but there's also a matter of taste, whether it should be way out in front or should be in the back where the band has more power. And sometimes, you know, people go against what the genre says it should be. So where do you come down on that? I, I tell you, it's a funny, funny, frustrating thing. Because like when you're you're working with a label and you hand in the first mix, you know not to make the vocal too loud because they got to have some skin in the game. So they say, turn the vocal up. So then you turn the vocal up and then then the next mix revision, you turn the vocal up again. And then what but what's ironic is when I listen to big songs on the radio and on records, like the vocal doesn't seem that loud. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't like hurt you, but sometimes people keep wanting to hear the vocal. So I, here's what I found was that like at, at the 2.5 frequency and everything's kind of fighting around there. So when I go to EQ the vocal, I literally EQ everything. I, I turn the vocal on and start EQing every other instrument. And then just like until I get the vocal to sit in this place, and it's usually like take 2.5 out of stuff until you get the vocal so it doesn't have to be so loud because people really just want to hear what they're saying. And if they can't hear every word, it irritates them. Yeah, I agree with you. It's funny how that works because sometimes – well, again, certain genres, pop, for instance, where the vocal is way, way out in front. And country, a lot of country is like that, although more the traditional country than modern country, I think, is the way that kind of works. It, it does. And you, I've also learned that if you, like, beat the snot out of the vocal, like, super heavy duty with compression and then, you know, fit it in a certain way and put it right up front, it's easier to listen to. I think it was Daniel Lemoyer. Someone told me one time that it was – Mixing, they start mixing the song with just the vocal. Yeah. And then they start building up stuff around it. And I think that's a lot of fun. It makes a totally different mix. Well, what I always tell everybody is to get the vocal in as quickly as possible. And maybe you'll start with the, the drums and bass, but get that vocal in right away. Or else at the end, you wind up with the typical problem where the vocal is either too loud or too soft and you can't get it to sit right. Or you can't, but it will take forever to do. It'll take forever to do. Exactly. No, that's exactly right. It's a funny thing. I get it. I get a kick out of it. Like when people are like, oh, I can't hear every word. But when I listen to like a Led Zeppelin record and I don't know what the lyrics are, I love that. I'll just make up my own lyrics. Like I don't need to know what every lyric is. Like um, I have no idea what some of those people are singing. And that's mystery, you know? Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't matter. The lyrics aren't <laughs> all that great yeah. to begin with. So it's better if you make up your own to some degree. Exactly. True. I have a production question for you. So you started as a producer of Band of Horses and then you became their bass player. What I found is, you know, as a producer, you have a certain amount of respect and people listen to you. But when you become a band member, that sort of dissipates. Did that happen to you? It's a really tough one because I enjoy being in the position of the bass player, being a producer, because I know that people will always like they always have someone in the band that they can say like, hey, does this work or what? You know, how's this going? They trust you. But also in the same breath, like we went and worked with Glenn Johns. So when you work with other producers that are legendary and stuff, like you have to just take a step back and go get coffee instead of sitting in the room and always making trying to help everybody out. And you learn a, you, there's a Zen to it to not saying things when, you know, something's going a certain way. Yeah. But um I do find it I do find it odd. I but also it's a yin and yang because the guys when we're on the road they can say we've got this commercial coming up. Can can you cut the vocals to it today? And then so I'll have my rig and we're in a hotel room cutting the vocals. You know what I mean? Sending it off in the web to someone else. Um, so there's it it goes both ways. Yeah. Here's another question for you. So you were in Asheville for a long, long time, and then you moved to Nashville. Yes. Asheville has a very cool music scene. Why did you make the move? Is there something other than the obvious, well, there's more business there? Or was it because of, of the, the different scenes or, or what? Yeah. Well, Asheville, I lived in Asheville for 13 years, okay? And there's a st recording studio there called Echo Mountain. Um, it's a really amazing studio. It's got, um, you know, it's got an 8078 in one room and it's got a, it's got a legendary API in the other room. And it's a great, great town. Um, but I had been there for a long time, and I had a girlfriend. The, before I moved to Nashville, I moved to Atlanta, and I made records in Atlanta. 
And then I moved to Ojai, California, and I had a studio out in Ojai. And then when I was I was in California for five years, and I wanted to buy a house, so I started looking around and I settled upon Nashville. I came here to this place, and this is a there's a producer named Jay Joyce, and I, this is his studio where he did all the legendary records. And I I found it and I could afford it, so I just moved to Nashville. And I'm closer to my family, so I'm kind of back in the south. But I still go to I still go to Asheville. But as a producer, it's it's so much easier to be here. Any kind of gear breaks down. There's a tech that can work on it. Yeah. People get into the airports easy. There's easy food. Um, and the players. I mean, holy mackerel! Like you literally call up ten pedal steel players in an afternoon. If one of them is on tour, the next one is going to come in and it's going to be just as good. And that when once you get that going on, you're like, this place is cool. I like it. I've never worked in Nashville a lot. I've been there a lot, obviously, but it's really funny. Speaking of players, I have a very good friend who's a songwriter, and she always does everything out here in Los Angeles. And then one day she sent me some songs to mix. Where do these come from? Nashville. Okay, how long did it take you to do? Thinking that she's going to say, oh, about a week. She said. Oh, yeah, we're done in about six hours. And this is like eight songs, you know? That was the rhythm section. I totally yeah. know exactly where she's coming from. I know exactly. I see that happen. And I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking, these were immaculate tracks. This is amazing. So, yeah. How, there, no other place really I've ever been does it, exa- does it act like that. Guys will come in here, and it, it means a lot to them to do it as quick as possible. Yeah. They don't want to give you more than two takes. I love that. Yeah, it's crazy. They'll just, they'll be two takes and they'll be like, okay, cool. That's good. And they, they, they'll do it, but they don't really want to. They'd rather just do the one or two takes. I used to produce a lot of blues records. And, and one I did was a legendary Joe Houston and um, doing this album. And he did the, the first song, did the first take. And I leaned over to the talk back. I says, you want to see if you can beat it? He says, why? I already did it once. <laughs> and basically he wanted me to pay him again to do it a second time oh my yes yes the old blues mentality you know <laughs> i i love that i love that that is a good story yeah yeah definitely okay so your studio i i understand you have a tape machine there do you use it a lot do you go to tape a lot yeah well the tape machine is always on and it, everything always goes through it. Oh. Okay. It's the front of Pro Tools. So when people come over here to engineer for me, if they don't have the tape machine turned on, they, they're, they're like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, turn the tape machine on. <laughs> and it's always on, right? Yeah. The sound of the tape to me is the sound of intention and the sound of uh, hyper focus. Like, I know that it has like certain tendencies of saturation and all that stuff, but what happens if, if bands are rehearsed and they're doing a good job, I say, you know, let's go to tape because they can. But if we're just literally just going to jump right into overdub land, there's really no need for me to mess around with the tape. I do like to hyper focus a band once they come in and, they're, and they, they, they feel like they can play it all live. Then we'll just cut on the tape and it's always rolling it, and the tape rolls at the same time as the Pro Tools. And once we pick on a tape, I just throw it into the Pro Tools and then throw it, you know, and just keep rolling it and rolling it. And then oftentimes what I'll do is if I start on tape and then do the vocals on um, on Pro Tools, when I'm getting in the mix, I'll just open up a channel on the tape. And once I have the vocals EQ'd and everything, I'll print it back to tape and then put it back into the Pro Tools. And it does a, it's, it does a thing to it. it you know, it, it kind of helps mix it a little bit easier. I can't figure out why. When you say it's the front end of Pro Tools, does that mean the tape machine is on input and it's going through the electronics? Yep. Okay, yeah. Always. It's, it's always doing that. And at any time, I can throw a tape on and just go. Yeah. Do you have a hard time getting tape? Yeah, well, tape is expensive. I mean, most bands don't have the budget for tape or hotels anymore. You know, it's changed. <laughs> yeah. So tape. I think a tape now is 500 bucks a reel. Yeah. You know? Basically, I think that's about what it is. I don't know. I, can't, I haven't looked in a little bit. I have a... I have about six reels over here that I'll go over until I'm done with. And then you can go to like tape, tape.com and buy reels. Uh, there's a guy in town named Randy Blevins that works on my tape machine. Oh, sure. Yeah, I know Randy. Randy has tape that he sells. Um, so I just, I, I, 
on that level, it's it's not hard. But new tape, if you can afford it, it's there. Last time I did a project on tape was maybe five years ago, and only at the insistence of the artist. <laughs> I have to say, it was a, a huge pain. Yeah. And it was a pain from the standpoint that, okay, you, you got 15 minutes on a reel, and, and all of a sudden, oh, let's do another take, and you look over, it's a four-minute song, and there's three minutes left on the reel, you know? It's one of those things. Yeah. Exactly. Or, okay, let's do another vocal and oh, there's no more tracks. You know, one of those things. So it, it was a huge yeah. pain, I thought. And it wasn't worth the sound that we got as much as improved as it was. It was like, right. oh, I would have preferred the convenience. That being said, I was coming in kind of cold. You do this all the time. So you have it down to how it will all work. And your, your extra reels there and everything. And you, you know in advance how it, how it will, will happen. You do, and you get some artifacts from it that are useful. I find that, like, when I use tape, like, I don't necessarily go for the fidelity of 30 ips. I try to, like, slow it down as much as possible and get the kind of, get the crunchiness and the and the tape hiss and all that stuff that's, like, a lot of people would be like, well, why do you want that in there? And I'm like, well, if you're going to use it, let's do that, because otherwise, let's just record a Pro Tools, because Pro Tools sounds great, too. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was looking at your mic list, and I... I saw that you have a lot of ribbon mics. They work for me in here. Um, I do this. Like, I go try new mics that come out. I'll go buy them, and, and I'll have them in here for a week. Like, there's mics in here that, are, that I don't have on the list right now because I'm just trying them out. Like, but in this, in this spot, I, my thing – here, I'll show you real quick. Um, so I have this thing called a, a Mogane. And it's basically a better cloud lifter, right? Uh -huh. So my one of my main vocal sounds is basically an SM7 into this. Yeah. And it just does it does something to the vocal that's 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 great. So this this sits on all my 160s. It sits on it's it's any kind of anytime I use a, a ribbon mic, I put that on there, and it adds this. It's a little bit more lows, and it adds it definitely adds top end. Once I started using the Mogain and the Byer 160. And uh, and using it with my RCA seventy seven, like the vocals started to get this really cool sound on records, and people would call me and be like, "What's that vocal sound?" And I, it was a one sixty, and it a lot of people want to see a big microphone in front of them. They don't feel like they're singing good, so a lot of times I'll just put like a big like something in front of them, and then but actually be using the one sixty, and if these people sing really really quiet, it's it doesn't really always work to use the ribbon. But I work with a lot of singers that sing really powerful. So like it takes it takes that heavy duty mid range and softens it out, and it just sounds good in this room. You know, I love them. One of the things that I discovered listening to your mixes is you're not afraid of reverb. No. And I say that because well, I guess it's coming back again. But for a long time, the trend was stay away from reverb and make everything real dry. And that never seemed to be the case with you. You were not afraid to use it at all. No, I mean, when I'm working on music, I feel like I'm building. I, I think about music like I think about photography. I think about it as like I'm building a soundscape and I'm building. I have a left, right, top, bottom, front, back. So people, I would build these like soundscapes and, and take people into this dream world. Like I, I was more interested in that than I was like, Hey, let's just document this band. I wanted people to be teleported to a space. And like, like the last record that I did that, um, that just came out was the, the brace and Cyrus record. And he was, he really wanted that much reverb on it. Like I wasn't sure that I wanted that much reverb, but like he just, every time a tweet came back, it was like, turn the reverb up. So I was just like, okay, okay, turn it up. But I mean, it's a lot of reverb, um, and I like it, but it's it's funny because people that aren't engineers, they come back and they're always like, oh, it sounds so good. Like, what is what is that? But engineers will be like, uh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That being said, do you have a favorite one that you're using? Well, you know, I love, for for that Brayson record, I use the, the one that UAD has, the, the plate, the EMT. I use that one a whole lot, and I use the BX20 a whole lot. Um, 
in in my in my place I have a master room reverb mm-hmm. over here, which is this tall spring thing. Um, I I love that. I I like to use the um, I, I I like to use the Valhalla once in a while, but I tend to I tend to mostly use the uh, AMT and by the uh, by the UAD. And I love the the two fifty is what I use for when I want a crazy when I'm actually when it's wildly sounding reverb. A lot of the times what I'm doing is sending the EMT no, the um, the two fifty the one that looks like RTD two yeah um, and it's got a lot. I use the echoes on that one and then I'll send that into a reverb and that's how I get like the really big reverb. Do you EQ it like you were talking about uh, around? Uh, 2.5 before. Do you like cut that on the reverbs to make it work a little, fit a little better in the track? What I do on the reverbs is I t- I take I take almost all the low end out going into it, and by that time I've kind of already dealt with the with the um with the 2.5, and then after the reverb I take even more low end out, and then I'll I'll take the top end off the reverb. I totally forgot. The reverb that I'm using the most right now is that 224. Uh, the last few records that aren't out yet that you'll that are coming out, I use that 224 because I usually used to have a 224 and I knew how to use it. Um, so I, I EQ the reverbs a whole lot and I automate the crap out of the reverbs. Ah. I'm always automating them. Um, my buddy taught me a long time ago. He said, think about reverb as EQ and think about delay as space. So I part of my vocal sound is is adding back certain frequencies with the re, with the reverb. Wow, I never heard that before, but it makes sense. Yeah, and you know, with the reverbs, there's always a short one on there. Like I'll have a really, 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 really short one that I'll create a space, and then there's always a slap. There's always a small slap, and then I'll have like the time cube for a little bit of depth, uh, left and right. And then when I'm going front to back, I'll I just work pre delays. I'm constantly working with the pre delay. Yeah, I've always been a sucker for long pre delays, but that's mostly because, you know, I'm a creature of the old days when the only pre delay we had was a tape machine. How awesome is that? Usually it was like 120 milliseconds, or you know, even more in some cases. It's the it's the way to get that upfront vocal sound, but also get a little bit of, you know. You, it sounds like an orchestra in there if you get the reverb right, and you, no one really knows there's reverb. Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? Because it's this nice harmonic stuff going on that sounds like the music, you know? I noticed that you do a lot of your own engineering when you're producing. Yeah. Does that include tracking as well? It does. It, it goes over and over. It, it changes only when I'm having to play bass on a record. Then I bring someone in that um, that does it that that'll that'll help me at least like so I can play bass. Um, I love to track. I, I think my favorite thing is tracking a band live. Like I guess it's because that's how I grew up. You know, taking looking down at the take and being like, okay, we're on take sixty-seven. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I've played this song 67 times. And then, and then you're like, you, I've played songs 100 times. And I grew up that way. And there's something kind of magic that happens, even though it's exhausting, like that bands just won't do nowadays. Um, or they just never seen it. So I love to track. I love to get the everybody excited at once and then, and then, get, and then track it. Ken Scott told me a great story about working with the producer Richard Perry. Aha! Uh-huh. And Richard had the concept of when he was tracking, the first 30 takes was just the band getting warmed up. <laughs> so they would do 30 takes and then the energy would drop. And he would wait another 30 takes until the energy would come back. And that's when, when he started to get his best takes. It's, it's true. I mean, I don't know how to, exp- yeah. There's something about wearing people down. Like when you talk about Neil Young, when you read about how he did Harvest, it says that basically he did the takes were done at like three or four in the morning when they'd been playing so many times that everybody's so exhausted that they just didn't have the will to try anything. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> it, it sounds like that. So I, I know you're a big UAD guy. What are your favorite plugins? That, you know... The the two twenty four is huge. I tell you what I use the most is um, 
that EQ by Brainworks that is um, – I, I never, I can never remember. It's like BX10 or BX something. Um, there's a, there's an EQ. I should just get it up while we're talking, so I'm not looking like an idiot. But like, uh, it, it's, a, it's an EQ called the BX Digital. Oh uh, right? yeah, yeah right. And that thing is amazing for EQing and getting stereo width, and it's got a nice. It, it, it's just awesome. I mean, I, I really love that thing. And then I'm using the. Um, I use the, um, I mean, they've got so many of them nowadays. I mean, holy mackerel. I mean, like I, I don't even hardly use all of these because I haven't, I haven't had, a, haven't had a chance, but there's so many good ones that just keep coming out. Um, I use the LA 3A a whole lot. I use the Cork SDD 3000 a lot. I use the, um, the little labs face thing. Yeah. Yeah. I use the, the voice of the voice of God a lot. Um, and, and lately I've been using the, the very mu cause if I'm doing acoustic music, I'll use the very mu and my main limiter is the Oxford is the Oxford limiter. I, it's amazing. It's on everything that I do. Um, and I use the Studer tape a lot. It kind of goes in like phases. Like I'm always using the SSL E series on, on a lead vocal because it's got some, it's got everything on it. You know, it's got the gate, it's got the EQ, uh, and that gate sounds like no other gate. You know, it does a little, it does a little expand thing, and then the top end you can just torque it. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that. Um, and then the bus compressor that they make, the SSL bus compressor. But there's so many amazing ones in there. Now. That being said, I see a console behind you. So when you're mixing, are you totally in the box or are you bringing everything back through the console? I use this for tracking. Mm. It's my favorite way of tracking. Um, once in a while, I'll mix on the board, but I mix in the box. I love this for tracking because like my, my snake comes up for every Like if you plug into one over there, it comes up one here. So I'm always working fast. And like so... When I'm on the tape and I've got 16 channels, I can easily get the drum sound and then push and then push like three tracks of the drums and get my drums on four tracks um, on the console. And then I can record reverbs to tape, um, delays to tape. It all works really, really good there. And I find with recalls, I'll do A, B, and I'll put up a mix and do the exact same mix on the board and do it here. And the board mix sounds sounds great. I mean, sounds great, but the box mix always sounds better to me. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't. You know, it's it's a matter of workflow in a lot of ways. Like, I'm friends with Andrew Sheps, and he basically mixes on a laptop in a in a little cabin out in the middle of the, of like England. Yeah. You know, a lot of guys I know mix can mix like that because they know what they're doing. You know. They know what they like to hear. It's funny with Andrew. I've been to, well, his old studio, which wasn't far from where I live. And, uh, you know, the, the two Neves that he had that are, are connected together and the, the massive outboard gear and, and the two 24-track studers and all that stuff, right? It was interesting because in talking to him, he said, well, you know, I started in the box and then I had to go outside the box for a project. I just stayed there, but I prefer to be inside the box. And here's a guy, you know, with every piece of outboard gear and every, every, every everything you want. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I've talked to so many mixers lately that have, and I don't want to say resign themselves to the box because that's not the case. They've just come to the conclusion, well, it's better being there, even if I, if I can't get the exact sound I can get at least 95% of the way there and just having the ability to recall is worth it. When I started making records, there weren't really recalls. I mean, no, not everybody in the, in the world understood what compression was or what EQ, you know what I mean? They maybe would call back for a vocal up mix, but nowadays like everybody has pro tools or everybody's at least done it before. So when they start sending tweaks, it, it looks like you're, it looks like they know how to mix. Um, so you get mixed, you get, you know, you get recalled all the time. I mean, I, it's so like, a, it's like that thing. I leave, I leave something for them to recall, you know, <laughs> I love it. You know what I mean? And it's like, cool. Yeah. I, for a while I was pissed about it and was like, God, I can't stand it. Why they're making it worse. 
Like, what are we doing here? It just keeps getting worse and worse. And, um, and then it, it stopped, you know, when you work with good people and they know what they want, like a lot of times it gets better and you're just like, this is awesome. I sound good because this person is listening on a system that other people hear it on and we're making good, we're making good moves. Well, that being said, you have the, um, the tannoys behind Well, actually the, the, they're not tannoys. They're, uh, the mastering labs, but they, they they call them manlies, I guess, because manly makes them now. Yes. Manly, manly got the, uh, stuff from, from Doug Sachs. They're basically manly speakers. Okay. So you have, you have those and I see, I'm not sure what they are back there that you have. What, what's the other set? They're called acoustic energies. Okay. And, um, I love them. I love them. And I also love this unit that I have called the arc. Have you heard of the arc? No. The arc is, is, um, let me get a little, it's, let's see. The arc is made by Odyssey. It's advanced room correction system. And it comes with this little microphone. Oh yes. I know that one. Yes. My thing with, my thing with, with mixing Okay, you know when you're mixing and you and you and you take it to the car and it sounds totally different. Yeah. So when you're mixing, you're it doesn't sound right in the mix position because you're just like compensating constantly for the 15 different other locations that you're trying to mix for. So you're you're ex- expending all this energy that doesn't need to be expended. And I think like back in the old days when they went in to mix it, um, wherever they mix, like they just mixed the record, and it sounded the way it did. Yeah. And they sounded the boom was the sound of that record. So I just put this arc on and I never look back. I just, I'm like, I'm going to always act like what I'm hearing is perfect. And I, and I just mix it and they just, it, it helps me save the energy of, is it right in the car? Is it right on the computer? I love it. But that's the perfect approach. And and you're right. Back in the old days, the mix was the mix and, you know, people went out in the car, but not in the beginning. When I remember first starting, that didn't happen all that often. And then it became more and more and more of an obsession as, you know, we went on. And then it became, well, we have to have three sets of monitors here besides. And, you know, it became over the moon with that stuff. You know, it was just crazy. You're, it's psychoacoustics. And you, you know how it is. Like, if you're, if you're playing on stage and you're, and you're hearing something and you can't change it, like, your ears will mix it for you. Yeah. It, it, you there's a weird thing that happens with your head where it, 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 at a different time of the day, it hears things totally different. But you compensate after a while. You compensate after a while. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. You just mix it yourself, like in your head. Yeah, yeah. Well, very cool, Bill. Last question for you. What's the best piece of business advice that maybe someone imparted to you or you learned along the way? Um, I I guess a lot of, a lot of me, when it comes to business, um, is how, how are, how easy are you to hang with? Um, that's got me in more doors than anything. Like if somebody comes in here and they're really fun to hang out with and they, they're good. It's like that, then they're going to work and they're going to come back. But if they're, if, if they're just a weird person or got a bad energy, like I don't, you know, they're not going to get, they're not going to keep getting gigs from me. I think it's more important just to be, just to be a good person, be, you know, be honest and just, and just, like I said, just be, a, just be a good hang and yeah, and you'll get, and you'll get more and more gigs. But obviously you have to be good at what you're doing. You can't suck, but like, that's what it, that's what it comes down to. You can find out more about Bill at BillReynoldsMusic.com. That's Bill Reynolds Music, R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S, Bill Reynolds Music, all one word. Dot com. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. To listen to the episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyowinnercircle.com or find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and now Radio Public. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyownercircle.com, you'll also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. <music>